when I was a fellow, we didn't have systemic therapies for these patients, and oncologists were not interested in them. Can you give us a little bit of sort of that historical perspective, how we came from adromycin not that long ago to multiple IBS these days? How did we get here? Right. So I think I started my faculty position in the year 2000, and these patients came to my clinic, and I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know, like, kind of go away. You know, it was really sad because I, I had nothing to offer them. You know, yeah. the, the endocrinologist would send it to me and I, I felt so bad, like, what can I really do for you? And, um, you know, then, you know, came adriamycin and adriamycin, you know, the response rates, you know, weren't that great. The toxicities, the cardiac toxicity, the myelosuppression, um, you know, for what little benefit. Ex yeah, exactly. So um, I'll be honest, I didn't really use a lot of adriamycin in my career. There yeah. were some other cytotoxic chemotherapy agents, and I know Martin will talk about, sometimes he does use them, like gemcitabine, um, for example. Um, we gave that in combination with docetaxel, but then came the, the targeted therapies. And so those became more in vogue for things like gist tumors and the renal cell carcinomas. And I think once people were kind of realizing that these cancers were very similar to, you know, thyroid cancer, um, exploration looking at these, you know, oncoproteins, you know, VEGF and RET and um, MAP, any of those other um, targetable um, or targets that, you know, are linked to, you know, the aberrant tyrosine kinase. And so with that, um, you know, we have these drugs now that inhibit tyrosine kinase and, and VEGF um, with angiogenesis that provide actually, you know, a sustained and durable response to treatment. So that's kind of where we've come from and, and where we're at today. So now the difficult part is we've got a couple of FDA-approved drugs. Right. <laughs> when do I watch and when do I start? Eric, help me. They don't give me theoretical. I want to know. When do I really think about starting somebody on one of these drugs, or when do I definitely don't? I mean, how do you sort them out when you see these guys in clinic? I think that the, the criteria that was put in the clinical studies for when patients should be put on this is not the time to start. So the idea of that tumor progression over 14 months, while I think you know we had to put in, there has to be something that was in these clinical studies for a lot of the patients is is too early. I think it's difficult to figure out exactly when the right time is, and I think it depends on a lot of different factors. You know, symptoms is an easy one. If they're symptomatic, you start. Um, and and what, in general. Kind of, what kind of symptoms do they have? Because you guys always talk about symptoms. What we never on? see symptoms in our thyroid cancer <laughs> patients. What, what it, kind of symptoms do they have? It depends on the location. Most often it's breathing problems if it's yep. in the lung or if it's you know, right in the hilar uh, lymph node or mediastinal lymph node area. Um, in bone, it's going to be pain. Yep. Now, some of those you can just radiate. So sometimes, if you could do a local treatment to take care of the problem, but if it they does have make symptoms more sense. that local treatment can't do, that'd be do, an indication. Then it's an indication to okay. go ahead and, and do something. And you know, and a lot of times, it's you know, when it's not when they're not symptomatic, it's it's location that's going to make a difference. So if you have someone that is a peripheral nodule that's growing, you know, that's doubling size in a year from one centimeter to two centimeters, I'm not going to be that worried about it. While if you got a paratracheal node or, you know, a parasophageal lymph node uh, or nodule that's growing even 20% um, in, in a year, that's going to worry me more, you know, one that can't radiate or was already radiating mm -hmm. and starting to grow in that area. So you're doing, you're doing like all this multi, so it's structure, it's rate of change, it's local. How do you decide, Frank? So I you know, I heard Martin talk about this once, and Marcia at Adboard, it was kind of really interesting about making a box. And then those people who have large burden of disease that's progressing very quickly, you know, those are the automatic kind of knee-jerk you treat. Yep. And those on the flip side that are, like Eric said, you have one or two nodules that are really just not changing much, and so the disease mm -hmm. is kind of more smoldering, you just continue to observe them, and maybe even with the yearly scans, you know, mm -hmm. at that point. And it's the people who are kind of in the middle, you know, the, the large tumor that may not be growing very quickly, but then you may want to treat depending on the location or if it's been previously treated with radiation, for example. And the same thing, those small disease burden that really isn't changing that much, more like yeah. the miliary disease. You know, that's where you have these lengthy discussions um, and meaningful discussions with patients. So oftentimes we move CT scans up. You know, there's some new kind of preliminary data which is in the oncologist about doubling times with thyroglobulin, like we use a medullary thyroid cancer to kind of follow those more closely. Those are the people I see back more regularly. And, and when I'm ready to start treatment, you know, we'll, we'll sit down and say, okay, look, you're, we're really asymptomatic here. Now you're a little bit more short of breath when you're walking up the steps. I think it's time for treatment. Yeah. 
Marcia, same same sort of ballpark there in terms of when you so start. So I'm I have a little bit of a different approach. So I think all of the things that are said are probably where I come out. Yeah. But the one thing I always like to point out is we actually have data. Um, and it seems like a lot of people like to just sort of say, oh, I feel this way, I feel that way. And, and Eric pointed out that if you do apply the eligibility criteria that were used in either the select or decision study, some patients will not necessarily have needed to be treated. But let's talk about the numbers. The numbers say that if you look at the placebo arms from both of those, even using 14 months for progression as a criteria, we know that people tend to progress a little bit quicker and quicker and quicker. If you use progressive disease, RAI refractory disease as your criteria, on average, your patients will now have progression-free survival in the five and a half to three and a half months, three and a half to five and a half months. That's pretty aggressive disease. Now that's true that in both of those trials, there's a tail. And there's 10%, but we're talking 10% of the patients, not 90. So 90% of the patients, that's a pretty good criteria. So what that says to me is, is it absolute? No. But now in order to not meet, in order to not act on that criteria, I have to have a reason. Yeah. So what are the reasons? Well, the reason might be that it's a solitary nodule, it's one peripheral spot. Those patients can be often observed for a very long time because as, as, as Eric said, it's a, it's, a, it's a peripheral spot. It's not gonna hurt them for a long time. So, so I try to figure out who were those 10%. But I think that lots of times people argue that 90% of the people have those 10% characteristics, and I just think that's not true. And I think we have to remember, we do have data that those criteria have given us data, and now you have to have a reason where, why it is that you feel that that patient's gonna be in that 10%. Um, but I, I find that people many times will take 90% of the patients and say that they would be those 10%, and I, we have to be a little bit cautious about not, not following the data 